It's a typical afternoon off for Bernard Tomic. Cruising Miami in his souped up Jeep. Yo, boy, I'm just being listening to rap music. For being he seems to not have a care in the world. We're going to have a race. But it's been the toughest of weeks. It's tough to find motivation, you know. You know I felt a little bit bored out there. He is one of the best players on the world, but he doesn't put in the work ethic, he doesn't put in the hours. This gifted athlete has infuriated the greats of tennis. If you can get motivated at one button, it's time to find another job. He's too rich too early. It's quite as simple as that. And disappointed his fans. I couldn't care less. Unless he gets fit, uh, he's a finished product. Time is, is running out. He's reached a crossroads in his life. Have a seat. Yeah. Which is part of the reason why Bernard Tomic has agreed to sit down with us. There's often been a bit of a love-hate relationship with the media. If I go hard on you, will you walk out? Go as hard as you can. I won't walk out. You're going to stay? I'll stay. I'll stay. If I did a straw poll, yeah. most Aussies dislike you right now. I've had that all my career. People don't like me and uh, this because it, at the end of the day, I'm just... Uh, I'm an honest person and saying what I feel, expressing how I feel, showing no emotion in a diff you can say in a different way, showing emotion and and they don't like it and I um do it a little bit differently. Are we witnessing the birth of a brand new star, Bernard Tomic? Bernard does do things differently. He's got it. <laughs> There's no doubting his tennis brilliance. Okay. But he's also thoroughly earned his reputation for being a tennis brat. Do you have a problem with that? Bad behaviour on the court. And off the court arrests and wild parties. But to really understand how far Bernard has fallen, you need to go back half a lifetime ago to when he was 12. I'd like to have a heart like Leighton Hewitt overflowing with potential. And the grand strokes of Federer. The world at his young feet. How much do you love playing tennis? I love it from the ground to the sky. It's, it's my soul. I want you to have a look at this and tell me what you think. How much do you love playing tennis? I love it from the ground to the sky. It's, it's my soul. Can I cry now? No. <laughs> that was, that was uh, amazing. Thank you for showing me that. Do you get sad when you see that little boy there? Yeah, it's a motivating, emotional, and I was about to cry, so thank you for, for showing me that. It was many years ago when I was young and dreaming of uh, being and playing at the level where I am, and, and I know, you know, I never would have got to there and where I am now if it wasn't for my family. You know, back then, you know, you're a kid and you dream, and I did love everything about it at that stage. What made you choose tennis, or did tennis choose you? Tennis chose me. I never chose tennis. Te tennis chose me, and uh, I became to enjoy it at a young age. You know, I never, it's something I never fell in love with. You know, I like it. Uh, it's kind of like saying, you know, I like a girl or I don't love her, but I like her. So I think that's where tennis became into my life and it's always been like that. Bernard grew up on the Gold Coast. His parents, John and Addie, migrated from Germany when Bernard was three. Four years later, he picked up his first tennis racket. I found a racket at the garage sale and so I got into it just like that. With his dad as coach, Bernard quickly emerged as a kid full of potential. He was talented and confident. Be number one in the world, win all the Grand Slams in, in, the, in the year. Tennis was all my life when I was nine, 10, 13 years old. I didn't know nothing else. All I did was train, work out five, six, seven hours a day with, uh, with my father. We worked so hard. But was it because you wanted it, or did your dad want it? It was in between, it was in between. Was he a tough 
father? Yes, very motivated, very tough, very tough. He, um, you know, he, the way he went about it, he was always waking up and waking me up, let's go, and then, you know, I would agree on a few things and let's go. And he was always urging and wanting me to, to play tennis. How hard did he push you? Did he yell at you? Was he, did he ever hit you? Was he brutal? No, no, he was, he was tough. He was tough though, like, uh, you know, sometimes when I used to mouth off to him uh, and this, he would grab the ball and like throw it uh, at me, like, oh, what is this? And I just became, you know, this tennis player that hits a ball over the racket and people make a big deal about it. At 16, Bernard quit school and turned professional. Playing against the best in the world in the biggest arenas. The Australian Open, when you played until two o'clock in the morning, yeah. pretty gruelling. Your dad at the time said that you would quit Australia and play for Croatia. Yeah. Did you contemplate that? To be honest, there's been big offers to play for different countries around the world. Uh, millions that, you know, people could only imagine. And, uh, you know, I never did that. I stayed loyal to Australia. It would have been tough playing matches down at the Australian Open, having a different flag by your name, but, you know, at the time I thought about it, the money was insane. Nothing can stop me, I'm all the way up. But the money was rolling in anyway. By the time Bernard turned 18, he'd made his first million and his life was in the fast lane. So fast that one day on the Gold Coast, he was charged with speeding three times. A year later, he was booked again and lost his licence. Driving around in an orange BMW and then trading it for a yellow Ferrari, you didn't ever feel that you were standing out a little? Well, not really. I mean, in my position at 18, 19, you do the same, I'm sure. I represent you guys. I play for this country. Do you think that you've been unfairly targeted? Yeah, absolutely, because that day, you know, when I got pulled over with the Ferrari, um, there was a reporter there within two minutes with cameras and everything, and it was like it was a setup. So for me, I felt a little bit like she was in my face straight away. I mean, how did you get here within a minute and the police officers behind me issuing a ticket? I'm not picking on you. Why do you continually get in trouble with the police? I was a little bit, little bit disappointed because I think it was all part of a team to get me. Bernard's troubles didn't follow him onto the court. As Australia's most promising teenage tennis star, he was living up to the hype. You were just this amazing tennis hope. You had the whole country behind you. That must have been a great feeling. Absolutely, I remember those days, you know, making uh, the third round this Australian Open when I was 18 and qualifying for Wimbledon at, at, at 18 uh, and making the corner final, uh, which was something amazing. You were living the dream. Yeah, exactly. Dad's not happy at all. But Bernard's father was becoming a distraction. A at one French match, Bernard even asked an umpire to have him removed from the arena. I want him to leave, but how is possible? On another occasion, John Tomic's passion for tennis boiled over into violence. He headbutted one of Bernard's training partners. I have a lot of pain in my neck and my nose. And this is what, just what I can say for the moment. I'm sorry. I'm very, I'm very sad at the moment. Were you embarrassed? Um, in a way, I wasn't. I wasn't. Um, you know, my dad actually did tell me after. Uh, you know, he spat in my face and I knocked him out. And uh, that's something I would have done as well. If someone spit in my face, uh, I would have done that. So um, in one way, I don't feel sorry for what happened to to the hitting partner in one way I do, but it's not my problem. It's something, uh, you know, my father did. And uh, if I was in that position and someone did that towards me, I would have done the same. So um, I can't comment too much about that. Despite the troubles off court, Bernard was still Australia's top ranked men's player in the world. But then came a series of humiliating defeats. September 2012, US Open lost to Andy Roddick. You were accused of tanking. Mm -hmm. 
McEnroe at the time said, it looks like a tank job. This is a shame. You don't like to see this. You were dubbed some of the headlines. One of them was Tomic the Tank Engine. You know, I've never been on centre court. It's one of the biggest stages in tennis, 23,000 people, I believe. It's a lot bigger than the Australia. I got out there and, uh, and say I was nervous. I had all these actors watching, and I think Nicole Kidman and some other, oh, and I was a bit confused and I was a bit nervous. Why do you sometimes choose to tank? I don't tank. Um, I just get disappointed in myself and very angry, and uh, I forget about what the score is. I forget about uh, who I'm playing, and I think about different things, even though I'm on the tennis court. That attitude cost him fans, and worst of all, a place in the Australian Davis Cup team. We had our issues, and uh, the, the reason we left him out was hopefully to teach him a lesson. Pat Rafter said, Australians are very forgiving, but they won't accept continual bad behaviour. I'd like to think he can admit he has been out of line in the past and mature enough to realise that. Then he can get back in the good books. Well, um, you know, Pat's said a lot of bad things about me um, throughout my career and, uh, you know, he's always perceived as this nice guy and, uh, and this image and people don't know him in the back of you know, closed doors. He's not that much of a nice guy and he's, you know, he likes to put on a show. What does Davis Cup mean to you? It means uh, everything to me is, is you're playing for your country, you know, in their sort of view, maybe it's not a good idea to make me play Davis Cup. You don't know which Bernard's going to turn out to play and you want the best team around you playing Davis Cup uh, and, you know, giving 100% and maybe it's not a, a good idea to choose me and that's why maybe in a way it's better for me to say I'm unavailable the last, you know, six months and this year until I really find what I really want. Do you feel Australian? I do, I do. The sacrifices I did in my life to, to be where I am now has, you know, made me who I am in and in an image in Australia that I would like just people to know who I truly, truly am and, uh, you know, I'm not that much of a, you know, cocky person like they say and I am an honest person and I wouldn't be doing this interview right now with you if uh, I didn't have uh, honest opinions and thoughts I wanted to share. We love your honesty, okay? It's good that you're honest. Can I be really honest? I'm yeah. sitting here opposite you kind of frustrated. I know. I don't know whether to feel sorry for you yeah. or to give you a kick up the butt and say, mate, just get on with it. I know. Confused like yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> Confused. That's why I am. I'm a confusing player on the tennis court as well. <laughs> Bernard Tomic has enjoyed all of the fringe benefits of being young, rich and famous. Making the most of it in Miami. And here, nightclubbing on the Gold Coast. We all deserve at the end of the week or, in my sort of case, at the end of the month or every couple of months to, to let loose. How loose do you get? Well, I can get loose. I can get... I can get crazy. <laughs> Depends where I am. One of the world's best tennis players is speaking out about his arrest this morning on South Beach. It was just a noise complaint and, like I said, I'm sorry for the, for the police and the disturbance I caused. On one wild night at his hotel room in Miami, Bernard got very loose. A party that ended with the tennis ace in handcuffs, charged with resisting arrest. I'd like to say I've learned, but uh, in a different way last night, obviously, I haven't, but I have now. <laughs> I was arrested, it happened here, not too far away actually from here, uh, a kilometre, but uh, proven not to be guilty, so, um, so it can be looked at differently. In general, do you party a little too hard? Absolutely. I think we all do it sometimes, don't we? We all let loose. I think uh, being young and successful, I think, you know, there are days when you can sort of unleash and, uh, you know, I really haven't done anything, things wrong in, the, in my past life with partying. Maybe I have gotten arrested. It was just a misunderstanding and a mistake and, uh, and uh, this will be me and there's been many people around the world that enjoy to, to have fun and relax and, uh, you know, enjoy their success. Oh, my. 
you will not see a worse miss than this. But of late, those successes have been few and far between. Yeah, I don't think that was the best effort scenario for Tomic. Earlier this month at Wimbledon, Bernard bombed out in the first round. It was almost a cry for help. It's a, it's a lonely young man that's really struggling out on the circuit. Well, Toddy, he, he sort of condemned himself, yeah. didn't he? And at the press conference that followed, he all but admitted throwing in the towel. You know, wasn't mentally and physically there in, with my uh, with my mental state to perform, and uh, I don't know why, but uh, you know, I felt a little bit bored out there. So, you know, to be completely honest with you, so Bernard I, also I boasted to reporters that he had so much money he didn't care if he won or lost. What followed? was an avalanche of outrage from fans and tennis legends. You need to go and work in a factory yeah. and, and do some labour and, and see what it's like to, to really work out there, you know, and, and, and fight your way through. Will somebody take his money away and say, OK, there you go. I mean, he's too rich too early. It's quite as simple as that. It's disrespectful to the sport. It's mm -hmm. disrespectful to the history of the sport. If you can get motivated at Wimbledon, it's time to find another job. And most of all, again, the spectators, they paid good money. These people that, you know, probably work in a factory, they spend their good money to come here and watch Wimbledon, and then they show, and the guy shows up and doesn't really show up, doesn't try, he can be bothered. Just stay home. It was that patch I was going through, and I did say, you know, Wimbledon was one of the most biggest tournaments and respected tournaments in the world. But in my opinion, I said my honest opinion, and I wasn't motivated the last four or five months. I was just going through the motions, and it just happened to be, you know, at Wimbledon. So I feel like, you know, I need to find my balance, I need to find my, my mindset, uh, whether it's now or in one month or three months, it will come and it's only going to be on, on my terms, I guess. So convince viewers watching you now who are saving up their money, who don't earn anywhere near what you earn, to buy a ticket to a tennis match to watch you play. Why should they bother? Don't come, watch on TV. You don't have to pay anything. Just watch on TV. There was a quote that you, after Wimbledon, you probably don't like me, but at only 24, you guys can only dream about having what I have at 24. End of the day, don't like me or whatever, just go back dreaming about your dream car or house while I go buy them. Yep, I did say that. I don't regret what I said. I don't regret what I said. At the end of the day, you know, it might sort of look in a view a bit bad, the way I said it, and we Australians don't like that. We don't like those sort of comments, and I truly aware, and that's why I said it. To piss a few people off. You were this amazing <coughs> junior player, prodigy. You had so much ahead of you. you. You wanted to be number one. Here you are at 24. You haven't quite got to where you thought. Are you... Cracking the shits, are you over it all? Is that what happens? That well, what not really, because yes, I had dreams of winning Grand Slams and uh, being number one at 19, 20, but throughout my career, I've given 100%. I've given also 30%, but if you balance it out, I think all my career has been around 50% and haven't really tried and really achieved all this. So just amazing what I've done. He's done it. Tomic's triumph continues. Bernard has earned more than $7 million in prize money alone. Millions more in sponsorship. He has homes on the Gold Coast, in Miami and in Monaco. But all that money doesn't appear to have brought him happiness. What makes you happy? Not many things. Not many things can make me super happy. That's, uh, you know, my honest opinion. I don't like to get super happy about anything. And uh, if I ever get the chance to, you know, win a Grand Slam, maybe only then I can truly feel uh, the, um, the feeling of uh, being really, really happy and uh, knowing what you worked hard for all your career. And, uh, you know, maybe I can light it up and win a Grand Slam or two. So um, we'll have to find out. Only time can tell. Are you only playing for the money? Basically, yeah. You know, I think... Uh, and I didn't come from a rich family. We had no money and, you know, I was 12 years old, 13 years old. Nobody knows this sort of life that I had. You know, we came to Australia with, you know, basically nothing. And, uh, you know, it was tough. It was tough. People don't see. We had a car, $200, $300, and now maybe going by, buying cars, 
half a million dollars to a million dollars, you know, it's, it's my choice. And living in all these lavish houses and property around the world, it's my choice. It's something that I've worked for and I've earned. And being 24 and achieving, in my opinion, a lot in the sport, it's affected me a little bit mentally and emotionally. So now it's just about finding my balance and pushing on the next 10 years and being successful even more. Do you realistically think there's any chance you will ever find love for tennis? No, no, no. I'm just going to go about it as a job. All right, play the point. Right now, Bernard is searching for a way to get back to work. Oh, you're trying to make me miss, aren't you? Today, he's helping a friend's son fine-tune his game. You don't miss, do you? Not so long ago, Bernard was that pint-sized kid... That's too good. ..with so much promise. Playing well, huh? You have to win. You're going to win. Yeah. What would you say to a young Bernard Tomic? At the age of 14, says he loves tennis from the ground to the sky. What would your advice be to him? Don't play tennis. Do something you love and enjoy because it's a, it's a grind and it's a tough, tough, tough life. And uh, if you want, the, if you want the, the good life to come after that, financially-wise, maybe do it. But if you don't love it, don't do it. And, uh, my position, I'm trapped, I have to do it, I like it, I'm going to continue to do it. But that 14-year-old kid has a choice always of what he wants to do. So that's the message, I think. My goals are probably win uh, all the Grand Slams in the year, uh, be number one in the world and beat Federer. There is a swelling storm And I'm caught up in I love all the, the trophies, the winning. In five years, who knows where I'll be? I could be at the top. I've watched my wild You know, I am a normal person, I am a human, I'm not Superman, I'm not Roger Federer. Uh, I'm not as a bad of a person that people, you know, see my, I am, and, uh, you know, I am, I'm just Bernard.